now. Okay. And now I will admit all the folks. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm just going to ask just because we have so many people um, that you uh, mute your <clears throat> mute your microphone and um, I suppose turn your cameras off for now just so that we can uh, have our panelists um, sort of uh, highlighted. And Dylan, I guess we can wait um, a minute or two before we get started. Just a reminder to uh, to mute your yeah and uh, turn your camera off just for now. Thank you. Well, um. It might be a good idea to uh, to get started then, um, since it's we're two minutes past the uh, clock, and uh, our uh, our our host is uh, letting people in from the waiting room. Um, so I'll introduce myself very quickly before turning the um, the floor over to Dylan Robinson, and uh, just say a word of thanks to everyone for uh, joining this workshop this public facing uh, second half of an event that has been going on um, all afternoon here among the participants. Um, my name is Jeremy Strawn. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Queen's University. Um, I'm uh, working uh, with Dylan Robinson, who is leading this uh, workshop here as the first uh, public event associated with the Dialogues Initiative. And our task here today um, as we set it forward to ourselves is to as you've seen by the, the description of the event is to think about the structures of white supremacy and colonialism in music schools and to think about how we move past those um, uh, those kind of impasses created by by dialogue and what can come afterwards um, and so that is what we as a group uh, have been working on um, since 12 noon Eastern Daylight Time. And we are uh, very excited to have everyone here um, in, uh, in, this, in this workshop. So I just wanna start off by saying, um, Dialogues is a research partnership between the Canadian Society for Traditional Music and the International Council for Traditional Music that addresses the decolonization of music, sound and dance studies, and which is hosted at the Center for Sound Communities at Cape Breton University. We're very pleased to have this workshop uh, be the first public facing event for Dialogues. In the near future, we will be delivering more events, including the Cineworlding Film Workshop with Dr. Michael B. McDonald from CUNY University and anti-racist pedagogies workshops in the fall. Um, the workshop, the part, the part that you didn't see um, that happened earlier was also made possible by Queen's University um, and the Banting Postdoctoral Fellowship Program. So Dylan, I'll turn it over to you. Israel CMCA, T Il Tol Squeak, Talitzel Quat Squa, Chitzelatzel Tahodan Shoni, Kesta Anishnabe Holmach Equila, Ta Oqua Almach Tatha, Equasaquilets at Tasius Tisiolaquash. So, very briefly, in Halkamalum, which is a language that Stalo folks speak, I introduced myself and said where my family is from. On my mother's side of the family, I'm Stalo or Holmach from Squa. And on my father's side, uh, mixed settler heritage. And uh, oh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Stala territories, what we call Sorchtamach, are located just outside of Vancouver, the area now called Chilwak or Chilwik in Halkmalem. 
Um, but I've been a guest here on Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe lands for about six years, trying my best to be a good guest and visitor uh, and support initiatives for um, Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe folks here, both within the institution and to a certain extent outside. Um, and it's been it's been really interesting for me to be here. Uh, it's the first place that I've lived uh, with the intention of living permanently in a place that is not, um, you know, home. Right. So, so I have those same questions to contend with as an indigenous person that all of my settler colleagues and um, other wise identifying colleagues also have to consider in thinking about how do we how do we support the work how do we commit to um, more than land acknowledgement and moving toward the um, transformation of relationships between um, indigenous folks and and settlers um, and then how do we do that work within our um, our institutions which of course is why we're gathered here today uh, I also extended a welcome to the two folks who are gathered on uh, very different indigenous lands. We use, um, so we say Holmach, which means uh, our, our people, but Ochalmach means other other indigenous peoples, the, the, the peoples whose lands that you are all gathered on, uh, as we are gathered from very, very many places in this, in this Zoom moment. And finally, I, uh, I said Israel CMCI, which is a greeting that we offer at the beginning of gatherings, um, which means, you know, welcome my good friends, but it has another more important, not more important, equally important aspect to that phrase, which means um, greetings respected leaders. And we say that because we, we want to acknowledge the leadership that we hold within these spaces that we gather in, the communities that we are part of, that we, that we offer our leadership to, so that that work that we are doing within the spaces that we are gathered in moves outward to have a larger impact in the world. So that is how I address you today, my, my respected leaders here in this, in this space. I'm thrilled to have had this very, it feels like a very brief uh, workshop that we had earlier, but with some really fantastic scholars, artists, dramaturgs, curators, and, and friends gathered together to start, to, to sort of begin a conversation on creative intervention within within and alongside, I maybe will say, uh, institutions and music programs, departments and schools within institutions. So this is a conversation um, that, you know, I wanna, I wanna say does focus on, uh, you know, resisting white supremacy and settler colonialism within institutions, challenging those structures that are really imbricated within the programs that we, we teach within. Um, moving beyond a mere curricular focus on, on the structural change that needs to be done. Um, but it also is uh, one, of the, one of the questions that, that comes up in this kind of work and that we discussed briefly as well is the way in which, the way in which we want to f challenge head on those structures. Um, you know, is that is that the, the 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 phrase the phraseology that's used sometimes is calling out or calling in, right? And the intervention can mean either, it can also be neither. Um, you know, it can be through play, it can be through improvisation, it can be through um, other kinds of gathering. And, uh, you know, I, part of this part of this moment, this gathering that we, we are in, the earlier workshop and this point today, really try to call us to think through what those alternatives might be so that we can um, we can move beyond the the kind of stasis and um, uh, you know sometimes even aggression or belligerence or beleagueredness. Beleagueredness came up in in our conversation as well that we all we all feel. You know, a lot of us teach within very small programs and feel like we we cannot already. Um, meet the demands that are placed upon us, but how do we continue this work of structural transformation in the face of that feeling of, of that real feeling and the, the, the you know, of, of actually being stretched so thin within what we're already doing. 
So the wager, the wager, one of the wagers that we're, we're making here, uh, the, uh, those, those colleagues that have accepted this invitation to join us uh, in this workshop, is that interventions, such interventions and play and improvisation are a necessary aspect of moving beyond that feeling of not being able to move in one direction or another, that kind of um, paralysis that comes from working within uh, you know, the neoliberalism of, of, of the university and the demands of uh, the government places on universities sometimes and the lack of resources that, that many of us face. So in my mind, one of the things that we are doing is um, refusing, <laughs> refusing, re figuring out ways or, or beginnings to move beyond that those feelings of stasis, even though even while recognizing that the the, the demands are great, and sometimes are um, insurmountable, but we refuse. We refuse to believe in those, or, or at least I do. I have a kind of uh, obstinate optimism, as I was saying, um, for for trying to to move beyond those things through creative intervention. Um, so, so we have very limited time uh, in our in our conversation and work today. This this group of folks, um, and we're all going to share with you a little bit about what we were thinking and what we were doing. Um, this is sort of the second part right now, the public facing part of a conversation uh, that happened over two and a half hours. So we won't be giving presentations at all, and instead we will be sharing our thoughts about what was what was important in the. Uh, discussion that we had and possibly also in some of the creative work that we're thinking about for this kind of structural transformation. So uh, before I go any further, and each person will contextualize as well a little bit about situate how they themselves um, are related to this kind of work, because we have a very wonderfully interdisciplinary group of scholars and artists and facilitators that joined um, you know, only as for those of you that saw the poster, only only a few, well, maybe about half of, of the folks who are, uh, who have a kind of music disciplinary experience and others having relationships to music programs or relationship to music performance, but not so firmly within disciplines. And that's really important, I think, because um, I, I, I often feel that one of the, one of the things that the university does is, is sort of affirm disciplinarity and in doing so sometimes um, marginalizes the imaginative capacity of what it might mean for us to um, you know, have a conversation like this about uh, structural change in music programs involving a large number of people who are not within the, such programs, but who have great um, ability and capacity to, to think imaginatively uh, across art forms and, and structurally in, in really impressive ways. So I'm just so happy to have had this this moment to gather with these folks, and uh, and start a conversation. And what I will do first is get everyone in our group to give a, a brief introduction, quite a brief introduction to who you are and what you do. And then after the introductions, we will each share with you a a little bit about where our thinking and um, creative moments have left us today. So I've already introduced myself. So I think what we'll do is we'll continue what we were doing, passing it along one by one. So I will pass it now to Sarah Stanley. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I am presently the Associate Artistic Director at uh, for English Theatre at Canada's National Arts Centre. Um, I'm a theater maker, director, um, uh, dramaturg, and disruptor. And uh, I'm presently um, a PhD student in cultural studies at Queen's University. And I'm focusing on questions about the sort of the supremacy of the 1951 Massey Report with respect to all kind of institutional questions that come up today. And I will pass it to Patrick. Hi, I'm Patrick Nicholson. Um, I am a research associate at Queen's working um, closely with Dylan and on my own work as well. Um, and I, um, I really enjoyed today's group discussion. So thank you everyone again. Um, my work is on, I'm a music historian um, and my work is mostly on <clears throat> kind of what I've been thinking of these days as kind of unfounded claims to property in music or in sound. Um, so questions of authorship when they're understood as kind of being um, 
maybe uh, inappropriate claims of having authored something, or at least, at the very least, um, the, the sometimes very, very shaky claims of authorship that exist in music and music histories. Um, I will pass it on to, uh, and thank you everyone, I'll pass it on to Rick Knowles. Thank you. Um, I'm Rick Knowles. I uh, live in Guelph and am Emeritus Professor at University of Guelph of Theater Studies. And I also work as a dramaturge and have specialized for the last about 20 years on, as both a scholar and dramaturge, on intercultural performance um, across cultures, across disciplines, across as many kinds of differences I can find. And I will pass it on to Natalie. Thanks, Rick. Um, hi, my name is Natalie Loveless. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Art and Design, teaching in the history of art, design, and visual culture at the University of Alberta, where I also direct something called the Research Creation and Social Justice Collaboratory, and another research creation unit, which is a signature area in research creation that's housed across music, drama, and art and design. And uh, it's a real thrill to be here with all of you. I will pass to Martin. Hello, everybody. I'm Martin Daughtry. Uh, I'm a professor in the music department at New York University, where I work on uh, primarily on sound and violence within the context of wartime. Uh, I uh, also the auditory imagination uh, is a subject of endless fascination to me, uh, as is the kind of entanglement of voice, atmosphere, uh, uh, particulate matter suspended in the atmosphere and um, environmental concerns more broadly. Uh, I would like to pass the baton to Leah. Thanks. Um, I'm uh, Leah Dector. I'm speaking to you from Winnipeg, which is in Treaty 1 territory. And uh, I'm a white settler, intermedia and performance artist and scholar. Um, I'm currently Canada Research Chair in Creative Technologies at NASCAD University, which is in Mi'kmaq territory. And I'm also the co-director of the Center for Intermedia Arts and Decolonial Expression uh, there with Peter Morin. Um, and that center is, I should say, in its infancy. Um, and my work is primarily focused on um, developing and activating arts-based uh, critical white settler methodologies that um, aim to contribute to decolonial uh, and anti-racist, anti-oppressive practices and paradigms. And I will pass it to, I have to turn my page in order to see who's there. I'll pass to Carolyn. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Carolyn Ramsey. I'm an associate professor at Carleton University. Uh, I taught in the music department for seven years. And when I return from sabbatical on July 1st, I'll be joining the sociology and anthropology department at Carleton. I work on um, Egyptian Coptic Orthodox music, predominantly the devotional Arabic songs that women perform. And I look at how um, in navigating between diaspora and homeland, how women are challenging and using technologies and virtual spaces to challenge the kind of liturgical exclusions that they've had to either sing around or get creative around. Um, and I spend a lot of time thinking and writing about decolonizing Coptic music. So that's what I do. And I will pass the baton, did everybody go? To Christopher. Hi. Um... I'm Christopher. I am uh, currently in Jojage, Montreal, but I am um, also based in Toronto. And I'm, um, I work as a multidisciplinary artist and composer and dramaturg. Um, I guess the sort of general perennial subject of my work is, is listening, ways of listening, practices of listening. And uh, this gets mainly refracted through different kinds of thinking about different kinds of um, ways of working in groups. So um, one primary place where I do that is that I'm part of a collective called Public Recordings in Toronto, which um, produces interdisciplinary performance. And I'm also have a big passion for creating um, 
different kinds of workshops and kind of um, inserting myself into various established learning structures to kind of tamper and I don't know if disrupt is the right word, but try to mix things up. <laughs> uh, Jake, have you spoken? Okay, Jake. Thanks, Christopher. Um, I'm Jake Moore. I'm a settler that was born on Treaty 1 territory and then lived for 17 years in Jajage, Munyang, Montreal, and now I'm located on Treaty 6 territory in Saskatoon. And Treaty 6 territory is um, the home of the Nehiyawan, the Dene, the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, and uh, one of many territories that claim the, the Miti uh, and Michif as their homelands. Um, I'm currently, I am an artist primarily, I make text too, and I'm currently the director of the University Art Galleries and Collections at the University of Saskatchewan and an assistant professor in art and art history. I, I work on vocality and um, um, looking at the voice as material, but also that that which exceeds audition. And uh, also I'm working towards a methodology of listening as an art historical practice. And I just have to say, beginning with gratitude, we've had a remarkable morning and uh, the, the few hours we've been able to spend together, I look forward to extending to uh, sharing with the rest of you and seeing what else will come. And who else is there? Leah, Krista? Um, that's everyone. That's everyone, okay, okay. thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jeremy, were there any other logistical things before we move on to discussing what we're here to discuss. I'm just checking in for a moment. Not that I think of, uh, not that I can think of, no. Okay, all right. All right, well, I will get things started um, by saying a little bit more about the background of this, um, of this workshop for me. And I think, um, you know, from conversations that I've had over many, many years, I, I'm not alone in the experience of encountering um, resistance in music departments from faculty members and uh, you know sometimes uh, students and staff to to thinking about how do we do it like how can we do this as I said before we're, we're stretched so thin we have so much to cover in terms of the core courses that uh, you know that are disciplinarily um, the most important um, I'll put a big supposedly in there in brackets. Um, you know, this this feeling of being overwhelmed, feeling of being overwhelmed, or as I said before, and and Rick Knowles brought up this beleaguerment, um, you know, that, that comes from, uh, uh, you know, trying to fit everything in, trying to fit everything in. And of course that everything is one of the things that we're here to, to discuss. Um, but I'm but I'm interested in the in the response. I think the response of often frustration or uh, reactionariness that I um, have have experienced from colleagues that is a, is a real feeling, um, but also often operates to shut down um, the, not just the conversation on where we need to go in terms of structural transformation, but shut down the imaginative capacity for moving beyond an either or scenario. And, and so I think for me, this is one of the, one of the biggest challenges um, that, we, that we often unwittingly uphold uh, and participate in this, this feeling that there is you know, a, an either or scenario, that it is one or the other, rather than thinking about the speculative and imaginary possibilities of bringing different things together that may at first seem like they are unlikely companions, unlikely to spend time together. So I am, I'm quite invested in thinking about the ways that we can challenge that through a creative capacity to uh, to improvise and play and, and bring things into relationship that may not seem um, you know, like they, they have a lot of common ground to begin with. Um, but for example, I, I can think of my own, um, my own trajectory as a, a, within, within music studies, where for a long time I was, uh, and I've said this before to folks, but the, you know, I was, I was for a very long time invested in Italian modernism. I just, and still have this love for Italian modernist composition, a lot of, you know, Italian white guys mostly. <laughs> but, but thinking through the ways in which this repertoire, um, for me, 
uh, does something really um, unique, not everything, but a lot of this work really engages with uh, temporality that has allowed me to um, think about new um, new ways of, 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 of articulating the time of thinking about um, indigenous forms of temporality, you know, so this is a kind of a partnership for me that I don't understand as being um, uh, mutually exclusive in any way. Although for, for, you know, I'm a very particular person here. I don't know of many other indigenous folks that are, uh, you know, it, it have this love for Italian modernism, musical modernism that, that I, that I might have. Um, but, but I think it is productive, right? Rather than thinking about, um, and so that's a, you know, that's a, we could say a positively productive scenario. Um, but we, you know, we, I don't think that we should be in the business of, of discounting things before we, we, we think about, you know, the possibilities for things to be in relationship. And so that is one of the, that is one of the kind of impetuses for me in, in having this, this dialogue focused on creative intervention, right? And, and it's funny to use that word even intervention, because I think a lot of the time shouldn't it, it seems too big a word for what I'm suggesting as, as simply let's get some, you know, let's bring a couple things together and see where that discussion goes. Um, that doesn't feel to me like intervention, that just feels like a kind of a possibility. Um, so I, I just started off by framing it that way for me that I'm really here invested in, um, in both those larger curriculum possibilities, um, but also spatial possibilities for bringing together things that might seem, uh, places that might seem unlikely, um, you know, to consider indigenous lands in relationship to the curriculum that we teach. And I might share a little bit of that work um, as, we, as we go along. I, I created a little event score. Um, as part of the creative work that I did in the in the workshop. I think, but also um, thinking about those institutional moments of refusal where a colleague says, um, you know, how could we how could we allow just any music student into the performance program? How could we um, think about not teaching the sort of core uh, era based progression of music history? Um, you know, these these things, the, these responses seem um, you know, pretty perennial a lot of the time. Um, and so I'm, I'm invested to think through that exact question. How can we, how might we do these things? And, and also think about possibilities for answering that question in a playful way. Um, so, so thinking about those, those responses themselves, whether we think of them as ignorant or microaggressions or, um, you know, just, just li limited, um, through feelings of, of, uh, of beleaguerment. How do, we, how do we respond to those kinds of statements in, in productive ways, uh, aesthetic ways and creative ways? So I'll leave it there for my own little contribution now. And I will maybe, we, I hope folks don't mind if we just pass this along as we did before. Um, I will pass this on to Rick. You caught me by surprise. I'm um, very Rick. I, I'm, I'm, this isn't something that, that really came up in our first two and a half hours, but it, it came to mind while you were speaking that um, curriculum uh, is an issue, is a problem. Um, partly because, and I'm thinking actually, Dylan, of partly of your book right now, is that we tend to think of curriculum in terms of content. Uh, and we tend to think of course outlines in terms of content and we turn, so at both the macro and micro level, the way we organize what we teach, uh, we think of in terms of content. And, and actually, uh, curriculum and course outline and all that sort of stuff has a lot to do with space, has a lot to do with time. Um, time in particular, the way we divide up the time on a, on a course or over the course of our courses um, is very regimented in very particular and again, ideologically coded ways. So, I mean, we might even, you know, when you talk about uh, progressing through the periods of, a, of, of musical history, um, that's content, but it's also thinking of time as progress. It's thinking of time in particular ways. Uh, space, um, the, the geographies of a curriculum are, are equally potentially coercive 
Um, so I'd just throw that out there that we maybe maybe can think of spatial temporal structures as at least as uh, at least as at least as important content as content is. <laughs> if that makes any sense, there's a start. Do you want to pass it on to someone, Rick? My responsibility. I'll pass it on to Jake this time. Okay. Thanks, Rick. I just wanted to take that up because I think we did talk about curriculum in, through the idea of the syllabus as a score. And we were talking very much about that, that thinking about that composition of the score and thinking about what the, exactly what you're describing here, that um, like if we understand composition to be the arrangement over space and time, uh, it really does take up those ideas. And I think the notion of not only looking to citational politics and uh, privileging ideas of expertise over that time Time frame, really taking on that responsibility towards how we orchestrate. And I realize I'm using language that refers to the musical, musical lexicon, but is not necessarily coming from a musical place for me. So one of the things that we were working on or that I was returning to was the idea of the boundary object, like those terms that we that we share across disciplines, though we use them in very different ways, and how we can use those boundary objects like the term score to trouble some of the uh, some of the sort of deeply embedded ideas of uh, maintaining expertise as actually maintaining white supremacy and troubling that, that in an effective way. We can all say we understand that, uh, but that, that question or the alienation that we feel when we're not delivering on what is expected of us uh, is one of the things that we really all need to engage quite personally and directly. And I have to say, Dylan said something very early on as we began our day together about uh, moving from uh, the land acknowledgement to the commitment to the land. And I really want to think that through in a useful way for us as we um, as we operate as pedagogues and other kinds of cultural producers that we are uh, committing to not only a space in the idealized sense, but an actual lived embodied land that is us. So um, I think that idea of, of, of uh, really thinking about how we uh, compose over time and space and consider our commitment to where we are, that we bring into our, our, our structures, different, not only different um, voices and expertises, but recognize the role, and this is perhaps my personal interest, but recognize the role of non-experts as necessary agonism to increasing what teaching is, which is the sharing of one form of knowledge with others, but it's not, it should not be coming from, a, in my belief, a, a site of, um, a passing on of new truths as much as an, an extension of methodologies of listening. So I think that that for me is really key, is that what I can offer uh, to students and others within any cultural practice that I entertain is to um, kind of open up the spaces of reception more so than deliverance and oration. So I'm gonna pass that on to Natalie. I knew you were going to do that, Jake. <laughs> it's been lovely thinking with all of you today, and um, and it, and it's a good segue too because I I'm a I'm a, I'm a guest in in the space of music as a discipline, um, teaching in the fine arts. But um, to follow on on what Rick and Jake have put into the space, one of the things that really struck me in our conversation this morning was the focus on form, right, and thinking through the scores and scripts that configure our disciplinary spaces and thinking through disciplinarity um, and that kind of uh, um, organization around disciplinary authority and disciplinary transmission as a settler colonial form that we can intervene into through thinking uh, interdisciplinarily and collaboratively, but not in the terms that the university usually means when it mobilizes those two words, right? Um, true interdisciplinarity, not as a, or even intradisciplinarity, which is something that I think was Jake, you put that into the space as a kind of Baradian turn on interdisciplinarity. And if we think about how Barad is configuring the intra, 
She's configuring it through, you know, Niels Bohr in order to think through relation as a primary unit, not two atomic elements that precede the relation. So in other words, intradisciplinarity in that sense is an emergent form that reconfigures um, structurally how we do our teaching and learning in these spaces. And so this is something that um, has become really urgent for me in how I think through how I want to keep mobilizing within the university and what I am committed to advocating for with my colleagues in you know, the drama and music, which are the two kind of disciplinary spaces that surround me and that were built up at the U of A where I teach um, in a really committed modernist form, right? Really, really deeply entrenched and not in terms of the colleagues that we have, right? Across all three departments, there are colleagues who are desperate and um, curious and interested in collaborating in all kinds of interesting ways. And yet the, 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 the curricular forms, the, 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 the kind of the tenure line forms, everything that configures the spaces we inhabit work against that capacity. And so that's something that I don't think we articulated it that way this morning, but that was something that I heard uh, a lot in the conversation that was happening. Um, I will pass on to... Jeremy. Sure. Um, so I definitely don't see myself as an active member of the, the working group creatively, just in the sense that uh, I think my role is more of a facilitator kind of note taker. But I did, um, the one thing that I sort of from my own experience um, recently as a, a white uh, male settler musicologist moving through these kinds of spaces is that um, I myself am often as somebody who does work on um, on and with indigenous um, cultural um, uh, topics and, and communities that um, I noticed that one of the things that we talked about quite extensively in um, in our conversation today uh, focused on space and the kinds of spaces and you'll see I dropped some of the um, that were the document, the Google Doc there, um, and I was sort of thinking that in in terms of being uh, uh, sort of merging sort of um, research and and self critique as a kind of creative act, you know, how can we use our own sort of positions to um, kind of engage creatively with this seemingly um, serialized sort of rehearsal of uh, what do we do? I don't know what to do. What do we do? I don't know what to do. And so for my own contribution to our, um, our, our list of creative interventions, and there's, this whole, there's a whole separate uh, working document that we're, we have that we're not gonna share publicly right now because it's an internal document of different kinds of event scores is to think about the way that you can insert a kind of a critical aspect to your own kind of, um, uh, conference presentation or land acknowledgement or that whatever sort of kind of formal um, official uh, part of your public uh, being as a as a music scholar is there a way to kind of use that and leverage it to kind of disrupt those those sort of heteronormative settler flows so um, as one example um, at a recent conference I attended I sort of sabotaged my own conference presentation by commenting on the conference itself in a way that because of the work that I do and the appropriateness of delivering a research paper on indigenous music in the, in the current Canadian cultural moment that we're sort of facing it felt inappropriate for me to sort of just deliver that research without kind of offering my reflections on the problematic uh, ways that uh, non-indigenous um, peoples were sort of dealing with this sort of moment that we are in Canada so I'll just leave it at that for now um, and I'll Let's see, who should I pass this on to? I'm gonna pass it on to my, my good friend, Carolyn. Sure, thanks, Jeremy. Um, one of the words that came to mind as I was listening to everyone sort of recap their thoughts here, but also to the rich discussions before, was this notion of cross-pollination. And taking um, kind of a hint, as I had mentioned before, from my own um, field research in Egypt, the title of my dissertation was called The Politics of Disengagement. And it was looking at how the Egyptian Coptic Christian community noticed and could articulate the gaps in institutions that perhaps created obstacles for them to be able to navigate safely. And so what they did was to sort of to withdraw and to use the power of withdrawal 
to create other spaces where they could have um, conversations about what it means to belong. And so one of the creative interventions I think of predominantly is, is very much this notion of creating safe spaces across campus to have brave conversations. Um, a part of the work that I've um, been doing at Carleton, particularly in partnership with village members across the university, is creating a space or an alliance for racialized colleagues and Indigenous and Black colleagues to come together and to create a sense of camaraderie, um, to share resources, and to also have a support system in which one can navigate and articulate the gaps in the system. I think much of the conversations we had here were Kind of articulating where the problems may be in music, but I don't think it's just in music. I actually think it's a broader conversation to the university. And the idea of pooling our resources, of learning how to practice allyship, um, of learning how to um, articulate um, certain ideas in a particular way, I found really useful. And so one of the interventions I offer is the notion of thinking of a space, not just for racialized Indigenous and Black scholars, but then allyship spaces where, again, in the same way that within this racialized group, one is learning how to become a practicing ally. It's very much the same practice that's happening beyond it. Um, very much to learn how to practice solidarity is where the stakes are always shifting about where one is practicing their own interventions. So music spaces have their own challenges, but the expertise of some of our colleagues across campus, they've already navigated some of the space before. I'm thinking of the, um, when I go to a Middle East Studies Association conference, um, ethnomusicologists are recognized as sort of the canaries in the coal mine. Um, a lot of art uh, and music happening in the Middle East articulates embedded politics. But I find that a lot of music conversations can not only benefit my colleagues there, but vice versa, to bring it back to music. So that's something that I think about, not just beyond the classroom, I was really inspired by Dylan's comment of looking beyond, thinking not just about contextualizing colonialism and sort of contextualizing the canon, but decentering it in a way to make spaces for the other conversations that have been happening alongside it all along. But perhaps the stakes are a little bit different depending on who is saying what. So that's something that I, I thought of, and I'm I'm really thankful for the space to be able to to kind of think out loud here with my colleagues and with you all. So that's what I was sort of toying with. Did you want to pass it along to uh, to someone else, Carolyn? Yes. Sorry, I got distracted. I'll pass it on to uh, Martin. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, I'm just all a bubble with ideas. Uh, I, first, um, to kind of circle back a little to um, the earlier um, suggestion of uh, syllabi as scores. In our earlier discussion, uh, I think it was Christopher had this lovely description of a score as not so much dictating a behavior, you know, or a script for uh, some kind of enforced behavior, but a score as, as a question, as asking someone to do something. Um, and uh, I thought that was really beautiful. And it, it, just thinking about both syllabi and scores in terms of, um, of a request, which brings in you know, the uh, issues of consent and reciprocity. And uh, that, that for me was just this small, small kind of moment of, uh, of, of real beauty in our earlier discussion. Uh, I also wanted to riff, if possible, off of Jer Jeremy's suggestion. Um, I, I was really taken by your, your uh, disruptive, self-auto-disruptive conference presentation that you described. And I think it's also possible to perform similar disruptions um, within written scholarship by highlighting moments of failure, erasure, and cryptic violence that that the, the piece you are writing creates, not as a superficial gesture before getting on with business as usual. So not as a caveat at the beginning, but as an integral part of the structure of the work itself. So, you know, I think it's um, one, one, one potential creative intervention that uh, gets us uh, away from the, the curricular ones, which I still think are important, is to develop a kind of writing practice that attempts to to partially unwrite or dismantle itself, to break, to 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 create a kind of friction or or exposure of limitations or um, uh, performance of doubt 
uh, or acknowledgement of complexity. Um, and I think the, the, the kind of field is wide open for that, but, it, but it, it's effortful, right? Because it, um, we, we, those of us who come from academic backgrounds have been trained and I think continue to train our students to make the most powerful argument possible. Um, so, so making an argument that kind of ends with, um, with an unwriting of itself uh, uh, for me is a kind of a tantalizing um, uh, frontier. And then lastly, I guess I'll just say that, that I think when, when I look at my music department, um, no, let me take, let me not look at my music department. <laughs> let, I'll, I'll just say that if, if a music department reorganizes itself around um, more expansive and elastic concepts, concepts such as sound, voice, listening, um, acoustomology, improvisation, time, as Rick suggested, memory, environment, experience, those kind of concepts, they don't automatically solve the problem of the white supremacist uh, foundation of the, the Western music department. But I think they do uh, kind of necessarily decenter traditional Western music concepts like harmony and counterpoint, Western music theory, structural listening, uh, and provincialize them and at least at least create uh, a, a slightly more robust ground for um, for providing opportunities for uh, decolonizing the music department. So I will say that my department um, uh, at NYU has is kind of I think I think we're kind of midway through um, a reorganization such as that, and uh, I think. You know, again, it's 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 not it's not a silver bullet or anything, but it is um, uh, by by thinking about something as uh, a concept as uh, elastic, dynamic, uh, troubling, um, multifarious as listening, uh, as several of us have suggested, uh, that that curricularizing that um, in a way that doesn't allow listening to remain its kind of uh, romantic, unmarked self that Dylan so powerfully critiqued in his book. Uh, I think I think that's um, that's a real that's a real possibility. Now, um, who uh, Christopher? Hi. Hey. hey. Thanks, Martin. <laughs> um, yeah. Wow. Uh, the conversation has been so amazing and wide ranging. I think what I was trying to get my thoughts together here, and I think I wanted to offer two thoughts and then an example. <laughs> and I wanted to come back to two of the kind of aesthetic objects or forms we've been talking about, like the score and then the intervention, the idea of a score and the idea of an intervention. And like Martin was saying, um, I think earlier, I, I was trying to sort of reckon with how these issues on the one hand, yes, we need to address them structurally, um, but also they do need to be addressed personally. And um, I think the score is an interesting place to consider that. Um, and the reason that I made this sort of working idea of the score as a way of asking was to sort of like point back to the idea of working on music or working in relationship to a score is always relational and so you're always sort of working on yourself in some capacity um, and in relationship to others and for me that's kind of what a good score is like a good score has a, a stake I would say a stake in the living a stake in transforming your perception or your experience um, of other people and and perhaps beyond that as well. Um, but yeah, moving it into this sort of relational or social, the, the, the intervention challenge is interesting to me because I feel like there are all these feedback loops that white supremacy provides because um, we were talking about the either or tendency. And I think um, addressing that through intervention, especially like very forceful intervention can be really productive. It can also feed back into another tendency of white, white that white people often experience, which is defensiveness, and then things get shut down. So there are all these ways that I think certain tactics can produce feedback loops. And specifically, I've experienced that um, as a white person, 
you know, trying to really forcefully point out a problem um, in this context can produce defensiveness that then really slows down the conversation. So I was curious what, uh, in my experiment this afternoon, I was like, what would an intervention be like that, that tried to avoid defensiveness? Or perhaps I think maybe as part of this uh, workshop even suggests is to perhaps avoid dialogue altogether because you can't really get defensive if you're, well, if you could get defensive with yourself, but then that would be your problem and maybe that would be productive. Um, so I was thinking about that, like what would be an intervention that um, exceeds the defensiveness paradigm and dialogue? And a passion of mine right now is is learning about conflict coaching and conflict mediation. And there's a a saying that is goes if you if someone doesn't seem like they can change, you can always change yourself. Uh, and for me, that's an interesting place to start a score from this idea that you 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 could turn the conversation towards yourself. Um, and I think that's kind of like a necessary a necessary component. So I kind of wanted to go out in a limb and actually just read my score because it's 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 in the I'm in the process of it right now and like we didn't get to share it earlier and I feel a bit like strange about that. So I'm just gonna read my score and maybe we can talk about it later or maybe just by reading it I'll have some reflections for myself. Um, it's called a score for a music teacher for ear training class. And it has several steps. The first is before class. Find somewhere quiet, outdoors, if possible. Consider the following question. When I am playing music, how am I responsible to other people? Take time to write and reflect in response to this question. Respond to it in many times and consider the different contexts in which you play music and the various aspects of your musical practice. Take note of how you feel when you consider the question. Thank yourself for doing this work. And then the second part is in class. Explain to your students that today we will be doing a listening exercise which will last the whole class. The first half of the class will involve individual reflection and the second half will involve sharing and listening to each other. Take the class outdoors. Share the question which will lead the listening exercise. When I'm playing music, how am I responsible to other people? Editing it as I'm reading it. <laughs> um, invite the students to note their personal responses to this question. Um, but first, share your own responses, share your thought process and how you got to each response. Share something of your backstory um, or information about your personal musical practice. Um, invite the students to find somewhere private and to reflect and respond to this question for themselves. Um, invite them to do this process many times and to respond in whatever way they want, speaking, writing, drawing, asking other questions. Come back together and invite each student to share what they discovered. Let them know that silence is welcome. Let them know that this is not a discussion. When each person is speaking, the other people are invited to listen and to not respond. After each person has spoken, invite each student again to reflect on what they heard the group say. Again, this is not a discussion. Thank your students for doing this work and invite them to thank themselves. That's my score for today. So I'm working on this, how you could do this work for yourself and how that might evolve into other spaces. Has that, who else has not spoken? Um, we haven't Sarah. heard from, oh, yep. Sarah, wow, uh, beautiful. Thank you so much for reading that and to everyone who shared so far. Um, prior to, to you um, reading that, Christopher, I was thinking about uh, um, inter or interdisciplinarity um, and both of those words and thinking about language and how quickly language becomes um, fixed. And that so much of today has felt to me um, to be, a, a, I'm seeing it through um, a person who owns a car and doesn't necessarily know how to make it run. And so what's under the hood? How do I get 
when I open the hood, why am I afraid to open the hood? Am I afraid that it won't work as well if I touch it? Well, probably, but what if I try? What if I get in there and see how mechanically it works? Well, they're all computerized now, and maybe I shouldn't, well, maybe I should defer. And so just thinking about how to kind of get under the hood of language and I started to think about the ways in which I also work in a conservatory setting often at the National Theatre School. So while it's not music, it has a very, um, I think, um, adjacent kind of relationship to some of the specifics that are required of students and how uh, the language has been co-opted um, many times that the students are, are really um, rebelling and refusing um, the ways in which the uh, uh, the hierarchy within those schools are using language that's not getting at their issues. It's not, it's not, it's not scratching their back. It's just kind of insulting. And so trying to get in from under. And so in, in fact, during some of my times there, I've worked on, on scores that come from their uh, feelings of uh, lack of agency and finding ways to open up into, for example, we, um, we did a day of nothing and um, the students had uh, every opportunity to not come if they didn't want to. And I think one student in the entire uh, body chose not to, which was, which was the choice. But I think the rest of them were really curious about what a day of nothing might, might mean to them. And so that got me thinking about a colleague who uh, wa was watching me take a picture with my iPhone and said, do you ever think about taking the picture behind you? And I had never thought about taking the picture behind me. And, um, and so now occasionally I do, and that links to this idea of it might be better. Um, and sometimes that picture behind me is better if I just turn around and, and, and take the picture um, behind me. Um, and so that leads to the, the last thing that I was, was hoping to um, uh, offer to this conversation is, as part of the last bit of work that I'm um, doing at the National Arts Center, I've, I've been working with a, um, a person named Nikki Shafila, and together we are, uh, have been working on a, a project called Workshopping, at this point it was called Workshopping Intervention, and it was essentially looking at um, how abolition and the institution can have any kind of conversation. And um, essentially we began from the, the premise, I began from the premise that wasn't sure if Nikki would wanna continue working with an institution like the National Arts Center. She has a very successful career as, a, as an facilitator, director, writer uh, in her own right. And what might the institution offer to somebody who's already so um, uh, employed and, and happily so um, in the work that they're doing. And so we sort of went from that question to what, uh, what does the institution have to offer to so many um, uh, artists and creators at, at this point, other than potentially income, which is of course um, not to be um, disacknowledged, but nonetheless isn't, does not have, I believe the same kind of power that it used to, especially in this moment of huge cultural change, whereby institutions are going to all the people who previously couldn't get in saying, please come in, please work with us. And there's a, a fatigue from many of my colleagues saying, you're offering me too many jobs, like please back off because this is feeling utterly disrespectful in the other, uh, in the other place. And so what we did, and I just offer this as something for consideration is we took the resources that were offered from the uh, National Arts Center English Theater Department and we gave them to a group of artists to come together for a similar um, timed meeting as this afternoon to share their tactics for intervention. And nobody from the National Arts Center was invited. And we hired two writers who will write about what happened on that day. Um, and that will be a, a document. So when I say no one, um, I was in the space. I'm an outgoing, um, uh, my role is outgoing at the National Arts Center. And the National Arts Center English Theater um, agreed to those terms. And I have to say it was one of the most generative, exciting, and probably um, I'm anticipating will have a, an enormous impact on what the core ideas and ways of thinking um, about programming, practice, and, um, and hiring, et cetera, uh, within that institution. So just wanted to, to share that. Um, and um, Christopher, I think I just got completely uh, excited by, by what you offered. So thank you and to everyone else as well. And now I'll pass it over to Patrick. 
Hello. Um, thank you, everyone, for all that. That was great. Um, I had two thoughts just briefly to share, too. Um, one is just that um, how much all the talk of scores today had me excited. Um, as someone who came through music programs my entire education, um, but was always kind of a, a score and classical music and art music kind of skeptic, um, I find it really exciting how, on the one hand, um, it seems to me, and I don't want to split the group kind of into, you know, factions or anything like that, but it seems that among people who are outside music departments or programs that the score is seen as a really like generative, exciting, open, indeterminate, relational, thoughtful, time and space based medium. Whereas I think often in the context of kind of um, my experience, at least the kind of decolonial within music school practices, it's kind of seen as this, the score is kind of the first enemy. Um, and one of the one of the obvious kind of first targets to go after as kind of one of the one of the bases of the problematic kind of relationships. And so I tend to always kind of think of these sort of things as kind of like functioning as homonyms. I was saying in the group that we're literally using these words, this, we're using the same word, but we mean drastically different things by it when we're inside or outside music programs. Um, so that was kind of my my big takeaway from from the first part of this thing was how exciting that um, it feels like there's kind of this like um, nefarious agent of potential like that we've built our world around that we're <laughs> that we're looking at wrong or something that could, it's already there for us but we're looking at it wrong or something um and towards that and too one thing we didn't really come to much this morning um though it was for sure present um was thinking about recruitment um which i think about a lot in terms of how much we tend to think of these kind of um issues of attacking white supremacy in schools as having to do with redistributing resources within kind of an enclosed environment of music schools without I've generally found without, and again, I'm, I'm someone who's not currently in a department in any, any kind of administrative capacity, um, but we forget about the kind of the constant annual influx on a yearly basis of, of brand new students entering music academia every year over and over and over. Um, and so to me, it always feels like the, the entrance requirements, um, the expectations for score reading, all those kind of things become the real um, pretty intensive gatekeepers to any kind of you know national or global sense of what music could do decolonially in an academic context. So that is one thing to me. And there was a prompt among the original prompts we received from Jeremy and Dylan that was really great, where one of them mentioned um, the kind of the impasse of the maybe a uh, member of a department who might say, what, so we'll just take in anyone. Um, and it strikes me as that the really appropriate answer to that is yes. Um, <laughs> like that, yes, a music program will take in quite literally anyone. Um, and then the question to me that becomes interesting is how do you then build a department around that assumption? And I think it wouldn't be that hard um, because I'm, I don't want to be dismissive towards first year students or anything. I think a lot of people um, who teach in music have recognized the fact that you are almost starting from scratch often with first year music students um, and or you're or you're negating bad thoughts they already hold about music or, or unhelpful, bad, unhelpful thoughts. Um, so all these sort of things to me seem really important is this, this idea of um, uh, scores as kind of dormant, dangerous things that we organize our world maybe poorly around in music academia. Um, and on the other hand, um, the possibility of just taking in literally anyone as a first year student and um, making programs that serve them. That would be my, my thoughts. So thank you to everyone. Is that everyone? I forget who's introduced themselves and who has talked. Leah, did you not go yet? No, I haven't gone yet. Okay, yeah, great. Thanks. Um, so much great, uh, so many great thoughts, and um, it's an odd position to be, I think, the last person. Uh, there's a couple things. I mean, I, I'm glad, Patrick, you brought up this kind of score, score, um, the score to settle. Uh, uh, because, you know, one of the things I was thinking is that, you know, we we got really excited about, about the score, um, but the score is nothing different than a performance or a cultural object or a syllabus or a course outline or a you know institution it's um or maybe i'll put a pin in the institution but it you know it's an aesthetic structure or construct that can be um very colonial and white supremacist and it can be used otherwise so none of these you know the, the matter is that everything has to be looked at in a, an unflinchingly critical way um, because we live in a colonial white supremacist society in which everything is unmarked as uh, 
colonial and white supremacist. So as white people, particularly, it's easy for us to not see, and we know what not to see. Um, whereas for BIPOC people, you know, the white supremacy and colonial structures are in their face, you know, every minute of every day. So, I mean, those are things to consider that nothing is, is escapes um, the frame of uh, the unmarked in, in our societies. And with that in mind, we also have to be thinking of what the risks are for different people in engaging in interventions um, or any kind of uh, structural refusal uh, or any kind of refusal uh, or, or uh, incursion of any kind. And uh, so, you know, these are, these are two things that I think are overarching. I, I'm not, I have no connection with any kind of music scholarship or music um, curriculum or institution, but I don't, I, you know, I think that the problems in clearly from the conversation today, the issues in within the, uh, the discipline of music in the university setting are similar problems in, in other disciplines. Some disciplines may have dealt more and some institutions may have been dealing with these questions and issues more actively for longer. Um, and what that points to is that there are models. I think, uh, you know, Sarah brought forward a model from um, an arts and culture institution. If you want to look at actual creative production, there are many models for these kinds of um, interventions and, and ways of being and thinking and doing otherwise. So, you know, I think that that's, it, it's, it's been so great to listen to everybody's thoughts and ideas today. And I think if, you know, if I, I, I just think that it's, it's really important to understand that these conversations are ongoing, have been ongoing, uh, BIPOC people have been engaged in these conversations and creating solutions for a long, long time in, you know, many places. And there are models. It doesn't mean that, you know, uh, we don't have to adapt and refine and, um, you know, create a new or create specifically for our situations. But the, there are models and, um, and, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an encourage, incursion outside of the colonial disciplinarity that gets us to the models that are, that are actually um, being undertaken in other areas. That's it. I think I'm the last person. I think that's right. Thanks so much, everyone, for all that you've shared. Oh, Jake, you want to, you want to close, close off with a, with a response? And then we'll yeah, move I on to the audience questions. I apologize, but I did want to just bring up that I really, um, I think it's important what Leah has brought up around the cost to different bodies for intervention. And it's something that I experience all the time where, uh, like as a new faculty member, I'm lucky to be in an arena that they have mentorship available to us and they do a series of, of gatherings that allow us to talk about what it is to take on these roles. And quite often a very uh, lauded white man, usually fairly burly and traditionally handsome, will say, I can do all these radical things and you should do them too. And then a recent immigrant um, woman with accented speech says, well, how will I try that? I, and I just think it's very important that we recognize the internal of white supremacy and the cost to the bodies that have not been made safe or clear and um, to 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 I think look always to the tools of articulations of difference and I'm saying this also to this understanding of the um, of the boundary object of the score like we use that term so differently across so many di disciplines but the important method that's being articulated again and again is by identifying the differences and including interpretation differences is where we actually get this benefit of being able to move. And so it's like recognizing it's not an either or, like amongst the prompts, there was this sort of question of, if we don't, don't go this way, we'll never get this done. And this is, I think, really at the crux of it, is imagining that 
interdisciplinarity as well as intradisciplinarity is itself a form of identifying difference. And we don't need to undo that difference as much as articulate it fully and claim position. So when looking behind us, as Sarah has suggested, we can actually understand what that means. But Leah, you really articulated beautifully that um, understanding the risks to multiple bodies uh, and, and the statement of difference across the board as, as one of our positive tools to acknowledge, I think is really an important thing to just underscore. So thank you. Thanks everyone. So we're gonna take about 15 minutes now, 15, maybe a little more minutes for audience questions and uh, dialogue. You can feel free to raise your hand using the raise hand icon. Um, if you have something that you want to say, all right, I see Tamara. Hey, Tamara. <laughs> oh, do you want me to speak? Yes, of course. I just saw your hand go up and you you were the yeah, first yeah, person no. there. <laughs> this is a fabulous conversation. I'm excited to be here. I just wanted to quickly say two things. Um, one, just because change has come up, that people resist change. By coincidence, yesterday, I, I became a member of what's called the Amiga program at UCLA, and it's a Mellon-based program to start holistic admissions, exactly what Patrick was talking about, that it has to start with admissions. And there was a woman there who I did not know before named Julie Puzzle, and she's written on holistic admissions. And she said they found out two things, that faculty resist change, and also every faculty member who's a little bit older uh, in the program, a little longer, has had a bad experience, the bad student experience. And they use the bad student experience to resist doing anything. And what I found interesting, and I just wanted to mention her name, and I'll put it in the chat, is that she had done all this research about like what can you do, not necessarily racially based, to change those people because it's an extremely common phenomenon in academia, the not wanting to change and the bad student experience. So I, I just thought it was fascinating and I wanted to mention that. The question I sort of had, um, in the States we use, Bi I'm not sure, if it, but in the States we use BIPOC a lot or in California, and I only heard among you Leah use it, and I'm quite critical of it. And I was noticing that Carolyn had a different expression that she used, I didn't quite catch it. But sometimes it's how we're defining everyone. Like right now the BIPOC has gotten really kind of strange at the UCLA, just cause it's super unclear. Even someone I love who, I, who just spoke, Jake, um, when you just said the burly white man and the woman with an accent, it could be that way, but there could be a burly immigrant. And like, like, in other words, I'm sometimes worried how we're defining the groups, but BIPOC in particular. And I saw most of you were incredibly subtle, but I still wanted to ask about it. You know, like how we're, how we're defining who's decolonizing and who's not. Because sometimes those white people that are resisting change is because they feel like everyone, um, I know that's defensive, but somehow the groups, the way they're lining up, it, it, I, I'm not explaining that well. It, it's just the terms that have emerged this year have sometimes complicated the conversation because they create oppositional groups when there may not be, ex like for example, class is not in there. Sometimes class is more of a, an aligning thing, et cetera, et cetera. But I just want, was curious how the group felt about that. And I was sort of noticing which vocabulary you were all using um, and it wasn't quite the same and I was curious. I can speak a little to the term that I, I used. Um, so uh, a part of the initiatives that we're doing on campus is to create a space where racialized indigenous and black scholars can come together. And we had a real debate about what to call the space. We had a kind of collective voting system in which we thought, okay, well, you know, if it's front facing, BIPOC seems to be the most popular and well known and well used in a public space. But what do we want to, you know, how do we come together? And the term that came up often was racialized, um, largely to capture the action of, um, you know, the values that are being placed on mm -hmm. difference. Um, because at mm -hmm. one point, BIPOC, it was like, is there a hierarchy? And based, and based on experience and based on even the literature in different spaces, different folks have different stakes and different risks and different privileges. But we wanted to capture this notion of what do we call our group and racialized really came out, racialized and indigenous were the two that came out to, to capture very much this notion of um, capturing the act of being made into or in itself sort of embodying and taking it on. So 
that's the words that I've used to give you an idea. No, it's really beautiful. I, I caught it and I thought I hadn't heard it before and it's beautiful. Um, I feel since you referred to me that I will also respond. Um, and thanks, Carolyn. The, I think it's, you know, I guess the, the best way for um, people to be described is how they describe themselves. Um, so in certain contexts, that's possible. In other contexts, there are different types of nomenclature that are fluid. Um, so I used in that sense, and I think I'm going to respond a little bit, Tamara, to your uh, contention about a, a kind of us and them. Um, because I think as a white settler, uh, I use the term BIPOC um, in discussing the extensive work that Black, Indigenous, uh, and people of color have been undertaking ongoing for, you know, since colonization, colonization since um, the enslavement of African people um, in, in these uh, countries that uh, we now call the United States and Canada. Um, so I, I wanted to uh, articulate the, uh, that difference that white people are coming to this largely recently. And um, there are models that are already in existence and created and elaborated that are not, you know, it, it, the way a, a black person undertakes um, uh, solidarity with indigenous movements is not the way I would undertake necessarily solidarity with indigenous movements, for instance. Um, but the, the reality is, is that white people are the intended beneficiaries of settler colonialism and white supremacy. And in that way, there are particular intergenerational responsibilities that we have um, that, are, that are different from other folks. And I mean, this is something that is very important for us to uh, embrace and to undertake very carefully um, and, and to consider as obligations. So, you know, th there, it's, it's not a matter of us and them. It's a matter of identifying what your responsibilities and obligations are as per where you are, who you are, where you are. Um, and there is a, a very intentional uh, strategy of separating, separate, separating out white people who are uh, receive an incredible amount of unearned privilege. And as such, you know, as I was saying, um, can walk through the, the spaces that are unmarked as white spaces with total disregard. Whereas black indigenous people, people of color are impacted that, uh, by that uh, constantly. So, you know, it's just something that white people really have to, to recognize. And that's why I made that distinction. One of the reasons. I wasn't sure if I should answer. No, I do understand that. It's just sometimes, um, uh, uh, um, yeah, I, 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 every, I agree with everything you're saying. I think the term itself leads to certain kinds of conflicts and that's why there's a lot of criticism, but I'm, I, I agree with all your reasoning there and I really like it. Thanks everyone. I think we'll move on to another question now. Uh, the next person I saw was Ellen Waterman. Hi, thanks for this amazing discussion. Um, I think uh, James Harley has already raised this question in the chat. And I, since there are visual arts and theater folks in this uh, um, panel, I'm interested to hear your take on the portfolio. You know, I've, I've thought for a long time that when you when you go to uh, apply to art school, you put together all your best stuff. You, you, you and and the impetus is to see what are you thinking about. They want your notebook. They want to see what you know what kind of doodles you've been doing. Um, I've had two kids do this. One institution was more prescriptive 
than the other. The other was quite open. So there's lots of different ways to do this, and I'm sure it has its own problematics. But I've often wondered, like, what would happen if music schools just said, show us what you're thinking, show us what you like to do, uh, show us how your, your, your investment in music. And that was the basis for populating music programs, as, as opposed to we need X number of violinists to float our orchestra, uh, which is quite honestly how lots of larger conservatory programs have to function in order to function. Their structure just is, is very weirdly put that way. So please talk to me about the problem of the portfolio. I'd love to know uh, the downside of that idea. Um, I'd like to just take a quick stab at, at that just because of what uh, Jake was speaking about, um, about the, the importance of the non-expert. And, uh, and so using theater and having been part of several years of different admission projects uh, for theater and in particular performers, um, you know, I, I, the, the success I would say of something like a portfolio approach is that there's not enough jobs and for musicians or actors in the, in, the, in the pure sense of you are auditioning as a violinist or you are auditioning as an actor, but there's tons of room for creative thought and addition and, generate, and sort of generative um, destabilizings of all, all manner of things. I think we're having this conversation now, um, uh, likely with a, a few artists anyway, who um, are choosing to uh, teach over practice or that's what ended up occurring for them or making different kinds of uh, interventions in their work that are still coming from the wellspring of their love of music or of the theater or of visual art. And so I, I am really um, personally quite suspicious of the, um, the uh, admitting on the preeminence of the top line skills that a student shows at the outset of their, uh, of their career. Um, and, and that's purely because um, purely because there aren't there, there isn't an end space for that student to arrive in, but there's a space for many students to change what the space might be that they might exit out into. Um, and so that that would be my response. And, and, and also just want to say thanks to Jake for sort of placing that into perspective for me in terms of thinking about that role of the of the non expert as being very important. <laughs> Jake, yeah. Well, maybe as an artist, I can speak directly to what Ellen is describing and the kind of gatekeeping that happens with that. And I think this loops into um, Patrick's articulation of the acceptance of a of anyone into a program of study that they wish to engage in and taking up the labor of actually being educators and uh, bringing many things to them, uh, especially as we know uh, through neoliberalism, our education systems across uh, Turtle Island, the countries that we now know as Canada and the United States, that um, they've been so uh, denatured from the actual transference of information. And uh, there's so little access to creative faculties, like music classes are devastated uh, and uh, art classes are gone. And it's kind of an interesting story that, um, you know, as a, as a high school dropout, um, I tried to get into the School of Art at U of M and I couldn't get accepted because my portfolio was inadequate. Um, and yet my they, they said they maybe could take me in because of my music, my, my punk rock, uh, because I had been a, you know, in this all girl punk rock band that maybe they could imagine me like a Laurie Anderson person. Like they, they had a format they felt they could bring me in as. So I unfortunately had to go to Concordia University in Montreal where, you know, I had to suffer through that remarkable, um, um, you know, a of uh, of those people, and um, I think about the role of gatekeeping that happens in those articulations and the suggestion of uh, like who will end up being the better participant, the better artist, uh, the better 
a, a person to take action. And I, when I think about what artistic work is in whatever medium it, it constitutes as, I think of it as a gesture outwards. It's a gesture beyond the self. And so for me, I want to know who's able to gesture beyond themselves. And at this point, when you're taking in young adults at a 11, at like, how old are you when you go to school, 17, 18? And I think about uh, what capacity are they able to demonstrate of their ability to listen, to respond, to participate, and not necessarily uh, um, replicate what has been presented to them by a very white supremacist culture. Usually like in those, those really articulated uh, portfolio requests, it's like draw a chair, a self-portrait. And I remember those things, but um, I, I would say the portfolio should include many other things. I'm also, I'll say one more thing, which is uh, we're in the process of um, giving an indigenous art award. We've been, uh, there's a donor that's come forward to USASC and they they see the that indigenous art practices as being germinal to healing. And they've got quite an expanded idea of what those practices are. It's quite legitimate. Um, and I've gathered a group of indigenous um, artists to to jury this and when it came to coming up with how would we how would the uh, application form look i was given some very important lessons about what should be a standard for entering into that conversation and was not send me 27 jpegs of your most recent work it was not uh, give me recordings it was not it we had we undid all of the gates in order to find out um, like our, our project is called Opinamaki, which means to lift up in the Hiawan. And um, so we wanted to know, A, what is your relationship to indig indigeneity and um, how do you lift up? Those are the two questions asked to enter into the competition, because when it comes to how could you name your Indigenous claim, how could we articulate that? Like the, we know what has been undone historically for people be, to be able to, uh, like you couldn't ask for membership or uh, allegiances. You have to find out from kind of a more open set of languages. So for me, the portfolio is another example of gatekeeping. And if what it's meant to introduce to an audience is the capacity of the person entering or asking to come to school, their capacity to participate in a program, we have to ask better questions to indicate what that capacity is. So it's going to take a lot longer, but I would abandon the, the particular kind of portfolios we're asking for, but open up more space for articulation. Like right now, we're just about to have a, a new student coming into the BFA Honours who I found on Facebook because his work was so awesome. I can't go finding Indigenous students in application forms. Uh, but, you know, it, it's it's that new thing of, um, it's not a new thing. It's knowing you have to look elsewhere and you have to ask different questions in order to find the people that will actually participate, not replicate. And I think that question of replication is one we have to really be moving away from. Uh, so I'm seeing that in the chat too, people that are articulating so well of what they've been asked to replicate and that it is this repetition that that is denatured of, of actually creative or imaginative practice. It's, it's a style as opposed that's being requested. So I think it's uh, abandon the portfolio, seek new questions that indicate one's capacity to participate and uh, open up spaces in a much larger way. And then we'll find out what real creativity looks like. Thanks so much, Jake. Uh, can I just say thank you? And, and, uh, and just that um, openness is what I have in mind, right? It's exactly that, that kind of thing. Instead of the audition, which asks, what have you already done? It is like, how do we present this? What can we do for you? What is it you want? What is needed? I, I might also add, um, can you tell us what you are imagining or might imagine? That's a really interesting question. Um, so we have a few minutes left. I know I know Marcia wants to close, but um, I see also we have so many questions in the chat that I that have flown by. I'm, I'm so pleased that there's this kind of engagement, but also I'm never very good at following all of the things in chat. Um, but I know Cyrus Robertson uh, Orkish has had their hand up for a while. So Cyrus, do you want to maybe, do you have a quick, yeah, um, sorry to rush. I guess uh, I'll, I'll ask the question and then keep the explanation as brief as you want, because it's a pretty open-ended question. Um, I'm just kind of curious. Um, there's like a lot of different 
people on the panel today that work in different um, contexts. And like we're today, we're mostly talking about um, music programs and the problems with, um, you know, whiteness and colonialism in those contexts. But um, I guess I'm just curious with um, panelists being from like uh, theater departments and visual art departments and things like that. I guess I'm just curious how you guys would like to, to what extent um, do the same kinds of problems or different types of problems and potential solutions come up in those different artistic fields compared to music? I guess that's my question. Like I say, recognizing it's a little vague, but. I went Maybe through I can, yeah. school and, and visual art training um, and I have found the problems are almost exactly the same. It's just that the particularities of the spaces where the problems enact are different. And so the conversation is kind of different and people's fears are different because people take up space differently in different kinds of spaces. But by and large, I really feel like there isn't that, that much difference, unfortunately. <laughs> Although I will say that I feel like there's something particular about the conservatory model itself, which some music programs in, in universities are modeled after more than others, which butts up against the idea of a university as like a scholarly space in a way that when I went through a music program, I found like a super unaddressed tension between like job training. And I think you were actually describing this in the chat, um, Cyrus, job training and like you know, research and learning. And that tension is maybe just rampant across all of all universities everywhere. But uh, yeah, I think it's pretty easy to see. I'll maybe add parts. something. Sorry. I'll just add something that I think I think they are similar in theater programs. The with the added in conservatory theater programs, which are <clears throat> not the same as they used to be, thankfully but many still have similar characteristics. One of the biggest additional problems is the, is the cohort, is the fact that you, you move a, the same group of students through the same curriculum, which is different each year, building to some kind of job training in the final year, <clears throat> whatever it is. And it's a totally pernicious situation. People are act, acting and working together with exactly the same people over four years, who often, of course, are all white, they're often all the same age. Uh, so they're limited in terms of what work they can actually logically engage in. So, and, and they're hugely, um, well, white supremacist in the whole, the whole gamut of ways that's, that applies. They're, they're talking white canon, white modes of performance, white every, so yes, the same problems apply in spades, uh, non-curricular programs can, or sorry, non-conservatory programs can be a little different. Thanks everyone. I, I think one of the things this point towards is the need for more of us to get together for this kind of interdisciplinary uh, dialogue, given the kind of the, the particularities, but also the shared, the, you know, the, the, the things in common with the challenges that we face. Um, so Marcia, I'm not sure if you're still here. I saw you, there we are. Marcia, I saw you chat, but do you want to say something in closing? Thank you so much. And um, just echoing that uh, indeed we need to come together more. And so um, the Dialogues Project intends to support these kinds of gatherings and sharing and learning together. Um, for those of you uh, who don't know, my name is Marcia Ostashevsky, and I am I serve as the director of the Center for Sound Communities at Cape Breton University, um, which together with CSTM and ICTM um, facilitates the Dialogues Project towards decolonizing sound, music, and dance studies. Um, uh, and so I just wanted to say a thanks as we are wrapping up today. Tan Sui Beng and I lead the international team of scholars uh, who are supporting the Dialogues program. And we all hope that you will continue to tune in to events and to comment. Uh, there will be different forums opening up to share your ideas. 
Uh, I've appreciated that people are sharing different resources in the chat. A recording was made, as you know, and that will be posted soon too. Um, so to connect and to share, uh, to come together um, through the next six or eight months or so of programs um, and different initiatives and activities that will be uh, coming online and into in different places uh, across the country too. On behalf of the Dialogues Project, then Dylan and Jeremy and to all of today's speakers, a very special thanks. Thanks so much for beginning these dialogues in such a rich and hopeful way. Thank you for sharing your ideas for creative interventions in music education that will help us each and all together, I, I hope, move forward on a good path toward decolonizing sound and music and dance studies and all of the other different ways that we are creating together um, in and outside uh, universities. Warmest thanks also to everyone who participated today, who connected, joining the session um, to witness, to listen, to share your time, your work, and your thoughts with us. And we're all looking forward to seeing you again soon. So thank you. This is my applause for <laughs> the resounding and very warm uh, gratitude for all the effort, uh, for bringing us all together, making the plans, making this happen, for the work that was done today that, that we're, we're just hearing little bits about. Um, but again, uh, we look forward to coming together many times yet in the coming months at least. And a very special thanks to Jeremy and Dylan. Thank you everyone. We will see you again soon. <laughs>